Yes, my mic is on. Ladies and gentlemen, at the Stands New Town Theatre, George Street, the best venue at the Fringe. Thank you very much. I would like you all to put your hands together and make some noise for the most electrifying man in Scottish political Twitter, Darren McGarvey. Good evening, folks. Good evening, folks. How are we all doing? You're quite rowdy. That is kind of how it goes at the Fringe. The closer to Friday you get, the giddier people are for no reason. Uh, I'm assuming that some of you are here because you're here to see me, but you're not quite sure uh, what the fuck I'm going to be doing. Uh, some of you will be here because you saw the promotion online, which was a bit more specific about what's happening tonight, including our guests and some of the topics of discussion. And then some of you, culturally adventurous, strangely open-minded people, have looked through the Fringe schedule and thought, I have no idea who he is or what the fuck he's doing. Let's go and see that. Now, I commend people like that, you know, because I can, I can ingest you into my algorithm. Hopefully, if I can charm you enough over the course of the next 60 minutes. But I will say, um, sometimes the people who are a wee bit more culturally sophisticated and therefore confident, they come in and they're a wee bit, uh, they've got a kind of sense of, I don't know, maybe superiority because they don't know who you are. They feel like the senior partner in the transaction. The implication being, you know, well, if I don't know who he is, who the fuck is he? <laughs> so this is for you pricks. <laughs> uh, I am at a really interesting point in my career. Well, if you uh, don't already know who I am, that's actually evidence of how uncool and obscure you are. <laughs> Which is a welcome, a welcome reversal of the usual circumstances. Now, don't worry, this isn't going to be a politically themed chat tonight. Uh, I know it's difficult, but I'll tell you. I'll tell you one political joke. All right? Do you want to hear it? Yeah. Right. Okay. In these times of widespread political disagreement, I am sure there is one thing everybody in this theatre can agree on: meeting Liz Truss really took it out the Queen. And if you like the sound of that, you should have came in my UK tour, which finished about two weeks ago. And if you didn't, well, I'm sorry, you missed the boat on that. I'll tell you a little bit about common people, first of all. This is an idea that really kind of went through its genesis uh, in lockdown. Like a lot of people's ideas, not all of them good ideas. Admittedly, I had some shit ideas myself. But the idea was... It was time for me to try and get back to my roots as a DIY artist. Somebody who took something by the scruff of the neck and created it and executed it right to the finish without too much collaboration, without too much oversight. But over the last few years with the success of a couple of books that I've written, some TV work that I've done, I found myself kind of locked into a more corporate way of doing things, which does have its benefits, but definitely can lead to a too many cooks spoiling the broth scenario and I don't particularly like being manhandled by PR people babysitting me everywhere I go. So I thought, I need to put something on where I'm in charge again. Something where I can express my values, make them visible, and hopefully I can find an audience for that. So the concept behind Darren McGarvey's Common People was really, I seen in culture, an absence of a platform for people not simply from working class or less advantaged backgrounds, but also an absence of them being allowed to talk about anything other than the factors that they've really struggled with in life. Get them on the telly to talk about their heroin. Get them on the telly to talk about their methadone. That's a nice facial scar you've got there. Let's get the camera on that. And what this does is just feeds that trope in our culture, that stubborn trope. That idea that working class people are narrow-minded, that they're coarse, that they're vulgar, that all they do is gossip, that all they do is spend money on shite. And while I'm sure some of this is true, and it has certainly been for me at various points in my life, it's also been my experience that the vast majority of people who come from those backgrounds that are misrepresented in media, they harbour interests just as wide, just as rich uh, as any... Um, 
self-identifying middle-class arsehole. And so I thought, what I need to do, I need to create a platform where I can prove this theory and get people on, not just to talk about the difficulties that they face, but talk about their success, talk about how they're kicking life's arse, talk about how they're leaping obstacles gracefully. And hopefully by doing that, we make an even stronger, even more fundamental point about class beyond the old Marxist analysis. And in that sense, we create a space where the audience out there and an absence of people and examples to follow, begin to identify with some of the people that we get on, and hopefully this might catalyze a little journey in their own lives. And yes, I can do a 30 second elevator pitch of what Darren McGarvey's common people is, but I'm trying to kill some time here, because I've got five minutes to burn. So we're gonna crack on. Uh, this evening, uh, is, is, well, all the, all the events have been interesting to me, otherwise I wouldn't have asked the, the guests along. But this is an area of interest to me which has been fairly recent in my life. Uh, I had no idea uh, when I gave up drinking that at some point in my life I would fill that abyss, that gaping hole in my life with a borderline obsession with lifting heavy things, with counting calories, with trying to get into a certain kind of shape. This idea that actually, even though, given where I grew up, my life expectancy, I'm already well over halfway there, if you get what I mean. I thought, here, maybe I could make some changes now that might culminate in me having a, a longer life, being more mobile, and in my older age, setting a good example to my children, and also, you know, increasing my chances um, of uh, date night loving when I take my t-shirt off on a Friday night. So for those reasons and more, I thought to myself, I need a bit of support with this because any change that I've ever made in my life, it's only because there's been information coming to me from somebody who's done it before, who knows the ropes. And so this set me on a journey where I have done a little bit of putting on muscle, a little bit of dropping fat, learning more and more about nutrition, how it makes me feel, whether good or bad, understanding the attitudes that I take to food, what drives compulsive or binge eating. And even though I know all of that, sometimes I still do what a lot of us do, and that is the 12 pack of toffee crisps rather than the banana. But it's been an amazing journey. And so I do feel that in this landscape where we're talking about specific issues all the time, there's a lot of space for us to think about the role that nutrition and health play, the interplay between perhaps poor mental health and poor nutrition. And there's one thing I can bet on, irrespective of the vast diversity of audiences these days, is that you all fucking eat, don't you? That's about the one thing everybody can agree on. Yes, we all eat. And so this evening, I just want to introduce my first guest. Uh, they are an author, a psychologist, who writes powerfully, not just about health at the individual level, but at the system-wide level. Uh, the last book that I came across called Unprocessed, which was an amazing documentation of the impact that poor quality nutrition, widespread available, is having on mental health at a mass level. So I would love you to give a lovely Edinburgh welcome, if there is such a thing, uh, to my first guest, Kimberly Wilson. And my second guest, uh, during lockdown, like a lot of us, had an idea to get in shape, and then through the knowledge gained through getting in shape, decided to set up as a personal trainer. Now, a lot of you all have seen personal trainers or you've heard about personal trainers. I don't know if, you, if, if you've any used one or considered using one. My experience is shop around. But I was very, very lucky to land that Nikki when I did. There came a point where I was just kind of hitting a wall. I didn't have the right information. And through a process of just working with Nikki and also watching uh, her business blossom, she set up with her partner recently, they opened a, a gym in the south side of Glasgow called The Rack. It looks amazing and they seem to be very optimistic, not just about their own future in that business, but optimistic about the possibility of inspiring other people to get involved, to make changes in their life that lead to greater sense of well-being, greater levels of health and fitness. 
This is the first public event that Nikki has done as well. So I'm especially grateful to her for turning up. But she's probably got a bit more insight into me in some areas of my life than my own family do. Because that's the nature of the PT client relationship. So I'll be interested to get some of her expertise and also maybe ask her to be honest about what some of my bad habits are. So I'm sure you're all really keen to hear. So if you could put your hands together for a warm round of applause for Nikki Small. Okay, let's kick it off then. Um, Kimberly, in your book Unprocessed, you're making what seems like a kind of basic point about the fact of what we put into our bodies has an impact on how we think and subsequently how we feel. Now, we have a, a, an era where it seems like everybody's trying to feel better, uh -huh. everybody's trying to get in shape. But we're all really struggling to stay the course with it. Mm -hmm. Could you just kind of outline why you think that that is? Why people struggle with change? Yeah. Um, basically, because change is actually really fucking hard. <laughs> like, it's really hard. What we, because when pe people have these kind of motivational messages or you see these very impressive changes and shifts and you see the before picture and the after picture, um, it gives the impression that it's something that's very easy and often there's a big emphasis on motivation. But the thing is, when, you're, when we're thinking about change, we are literally talking about changing your brain. We are talking about either, well, both processes, kind of um, reducing the activity of the old habits, the pathways that lead, led to the old habits, and then building new pathways to your new habits. And that's because, essentially, your brain is very... Um, energy efficient. It doesn't like to waste energy. It doesn't like to expend energy. Your brain burns a lot of energy, so it's always trying to hold on to it. And so habit is a very efficient way of your brain to make decisions and choices and behaviors. If you had to think about every single thing you did, you'd be exhausted. And so we lean back on things that we've done over and over and over again because they are energy efficient for your brain. And so what that means is when you are making a change, you have to expend an enormous amount of energy to kind of pull yourself, the analogy that I use is like, um, you know when you go to a park, if you're going for a run in a park and there's a pathway from all the other runners that have ever run through that park, that is the old habit, that's the pathway. And you, even if you've never been to that park before, you'll find yourself veering onto it because you're like, oh, everybody else has gone here, this must be the pathway. So you have to use a lot of energy to move off of that path, that old habit, and then you've got to repeat over and over and over again to form a new pathway. And I think that piece of information isn't given to people enough. Yeah, You're changing your brain. I also have this feeling as well that the people who manufacture some of the worst food and some of the worst products out there, they seem to know more about our psychology than we do. So it's almost like they take into consideration all of this stuff that you've said and then they commission the food engineers to go and make something that not only tastes amazing, but also attacks us at that fundamental level and plays on those vulnerabilities. Is that a conspiracy theory or is that part of how food is developed and marketed? Listen, friend. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it concise. Um, uh, your brain works on prediction. Um, it, you're, again, you're never dealing with the world moment to moment. So it deals with prediction and habit and expectation. The way that you choose to eat is not a rational decision. It is a decision based on your previous experience. That's why it really matters, the foods that are advertised to children. And it really matters the composition of foods that we eat because we do have some innate food preferences from evolution. We have a preference for sweet, salty, umami, because they tell your body about the nutritional content of those foods. Sweet says carbohydrates, your brain runs on glucose, we need that. Salty says, um, well, your, your nerves run on sodium ions, so you need that. Umami is, is protein, which you need to build your body. So these basic tastes are actually nutritional information. And in our evolutionary history, you would have to eat a wide range of foods in order to, to get those nutrients, but what we've done, what food industry has done, which is completely novel to the human organism, is extract those compounds, 
concentrate them and then combine them in ways that are just not natural. And then it's a kind of hyper normal intense drive yeah. for and, those foods. And it's also, I'm, I'm going to come to you, Nikki, mm. in, a, in a second, but it's also that previously all food consumption was in the context of scarcity. Mm -hmm. And now there's such abundance of these foods that are specifically configured to set off all of the little tasty alarms that go on yeah, at yeah. the level of the mind and, and the body. And what what is, is difficult is that we understand the wider public health cost of this, but it's, it's notoriously difficult to regulate or get under control, isn't it? Is it difficult? <laughs> Well, I don't think, it, when I say that, I'm saying it with a tongue in cheek, but it is, it is difficult in the sense of the power yeah. of the forces that bank on us continuing to consume food at the level that we do, which has sure. underpinned a, a Western obesity epidemic and all of the other peripheral health issues associated with it. It is challenging in the face of that kind of corporate power, isn't it? For sure. And, and so I, I will say two very quick things. The one is that, you know, we, we eat habitually and there are regulations, for example, about the amount of sugar that toddlers should eat. Basically, children under two aren't supposed to have any additional free sugars. Yet, we are advertised and marketed a product at Farley's Rusk. Sorry if anybody here works for Farley's. Um, but Farley's Rusk, which is advertised as a, a, a weaning food, an ideal first food. It's soft, it's delicious, it's 30% sugar. And the foods that you eat early in life, both, both um, the, the flavors that you get in utero, so what you can taste what your mother is eating, and also in early in life, build your flavor preferences as an adult. So feeding a child these very sweet foods that they shouldn't be eating starts to build a preference for those things. And then absolutely, the food lobby have so much money and they end up getting jobs alongside health ministers. They end up funding various things, contributing to parties and they, are, they put together guidance documentations that, that sit in and look like, and they can fund research. They can fund research that supports their own aims. Mars bars are great for mental health oh. for about 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because so few of our politicians have real world experience, <laughs> real world health experience, and they, the health minister often isn't, a doctor or you know whatever um they'll just go along with what of these guidance documents are or these other biases that are introduced okay now let, let's bring it away from the kind of system-wide stuff nikki and just get the ball on deck in terms of your day-to-day -day work uh is involved in providing advice support training um to individual clients who approach you uh, for a period of time, sometimes a short period, sometimes a longer period, yeah. uh, because they want to change some aspect of, of their lifestyle or their fitness. Um, I want to start by just asking, what is the most common problem that you see among, all, uh, among your, your, your clients? What is the thing that almost everyone struggles with? Well, everyone says their struggle is time. They don't have enough time, but often it's actually their perception that they don't have enough time it's actually poor time management because and we are busier than we have probably ever been it is a lot more stressful there's a lot more demands placed on people these days than there used to be so like you said we're living in abundance at the minute so it's very easy to go to those foods you know and go to the foods that are just very quick to pick up that are just going to satisfy you instantly um, and the thing is you don't even need to go out to the shop anymore to get it you can just click of the button on your phone you don't even need to walk up and get your purse to get your card anymore like it's just all done so it's everything's super convenient and people just go I don't have the time to make a nice meal I don't have the time to go a walk I don't have the time to go to the gym but actually they do it just needs a bit of planning and organization um, and I say that I know there'll be some people sitting there going no I honestly don't have time and I get it that everyone's situation is different but it might be then you don't have the time to do the absolute ideal to get where you want, but you've still got time to do something. So something is better than nothing. Um, so and and that, that, that's a great point um, in terms of 
for some reason we look at the experience of our life where we've been trying to change and we haven't been able to and then for some reason we think we're going to be capable of a complete internal external revolution yeah. just because it's Monday <laughs> you know and so there is a part of your job which is about giving people permission to take the right amount of time yeah. to adjust to the incremental changes that you're suggesting because like you say doing something is better than doing nothing but that's a difficult thinking habit to get out of because we've got a generation of people perhaps as kids that might have been over punished for things they've got this perfectionism they think that there's consequences for not getting it right all the time and I certainly found that 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 permeated my attitude to my training where if I wasn't putting more weight on the bar every time and I wasn't getting the right nutrition in all the time it would lead to a negative mindset that would lead to not going to the gym and just binge eating like hitting the fuck it button as many people say so how do you support people to recognize that maybe they're a bit extremist in their thinking and that actually it is easier if you can just change that thought process it's just constantly reminding people that you are the result of your consistent actions so as long as the majority of the time you're doing all right then you're going to be all right do you know and it's just about People, like you say, beat themselves up. People have a tendency to always look towards the negative and go, oh, well, that bit didn't go well, so I've, I've fucked it. But actually, you can go, well, this bit, this bit, and this bit went well, so let's focus on that. I very much try and get them focusing on the positives. Um, and also, I'm just there constantly. Like, you know, like, if you message me going, I didn't get to the gym, it's like, well, it's all right. It's not the end of the world. Go tomorrow. You know, it's just about sort of reminding them that, like, okay, well, we just, we don't just stop then. We just draw a line under it and get back on track with the next thing we do. The, um, the, the, the One of the biggest challenges I faced personally in the beginning, because my idea to get in shape really like a lot of, 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 of recent developments in, in my life was inspired by the fact my first child was on the way. And so, you know, I was thinking I need to make something happen with this career. I need to really go for it and I need to try and get in shape. What I didn't realise is that I was going to gain about 20 pounds. <laughs> just through the process of dealing with a newborn. And that those first <laughs> few weeks, it's a bit like the twilight zone between Christmas and New Year, <laughs> where you don't know what time of day it is, you don't know what's happening, you're just kind of sitting there in a daze and having ice cream and pizza delivered <laughs> directly into your face at strange times of the morning. Now, it's, it, it, it's, it's challenging um, when, when, someone, uh, when someone decides that they're gonna make make a change but what sort of obstacles at this wider social level will they be facing as well as the nutrition uh, mm -hmm. because there is an abundance of bad nutritional information bad fitness advice mm -hmm. terrible mental health advice through youtube social media real grifters out there mm -hmm. who sometimes are being handed pieces of paper and told what to say just because they're really good looking and this increases the chances of people believing them and this must have a detrimental impact mm. on getting the right information to people, Kimberly. Yeah, it's, and, and the thing about that is that, well, there are a few things. So one is it takes, I can't remember what the name of the law is. It's like, but the, the energy required to refute bullshit is like exponentially more than it is to, to say it. So it's like somebody can say something ridiculous and then it will take much more energy for a sensible, qualified person to try to shut that down and give people the right information. So there's that kind of, imbalance in that part of it um, but also it's it's kind of really hard to make the fundamentals sexy like you can talk about oh this magic berry is going to make you live 700 times long. <laughs> like you, you can come up with these like extraordinary rub this crystal on your eye and you can see into the future like all of this stuff but the the fundamentals which is vegetable, like eat more beans, <laughs> are very, very boring. And it's hard to kind of get people on board to actually there's real evidence and, and, and good, good ideas behind that. So I think there's that kind of asymmetry in trying to make the fundamental information sexy. But then there's also just the real obstacles that we know are out there. We know that there's a massive difference in healthy life expectancy and mortality in the wealthiest and poorest groups. So someone who is born in an area of, of the most deprivation will get sick nearly 20 years before the wealthiest and die 10 years before them as well. And that's about, and, and a lot of people, 
<laughs> there's a section of my book where um, there have been a lot of politicians who have said things like, poor people just don't know how to manage their budgets and they just don't know how to have to cook and you can make soup, make carrot <laughs> soup. Um, so this is kind of real um, cruelty, I think, ignorance and cruelty. Um, but there are fundamental barriers. So even if you wanted to um, go out and buy those carrots, you need to live somewhere where you have access to those things. You need to not live in a food desert where actually the only shops around you sell ultra processed and uh, the kind of least healthy foods. You need to have access to something to cook on, to have saucepans. You need to be able to afford the energy it takes to cook those foods. You need to have the time to prepare them and you need to have the money to be able to afford to have them because we cannot talk about choice. We have no rational basis to say that people are making bad choices when they are actually priced out yeah. of a healthy diet. Yeah, and, and the thing is we talk about that and there is a place obviously for discussion at the level of the individual. And, and, and we'll always come back to that with you, Nikki, working with your clients. But when we're looking at phenomena that's occurring at the social level, there's a higher concentration of people with obesity-related health problems. It's more difficult to, 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 to claim empirically that that's a result of individual choices because when something's occurring at the social level, surely that is evidence of something that's going on contextually, whether it's the environment whether it's the stress levels, I mean, I would say that that is part of the environment. If something's, it can't just be that just by coincidence, people that live on this side of the train track all live like this, mm -hmm. and people on that side of the train track all live like that. And, and it's weird how persistent this individual personal responsibility argument has been, because most people know it's within them to ultimately decide to make the change. Mm -hmm. The question is, what are the asymmetric fucking barriers in their way to them doing that? Yeah, and it's and there are kind of a couple of reasons for that. So one is that we overestimate how rational and conscious our decisions are. Like so many of your decisions are unconscious. They are driven by the environment. They are driven by your past behaviour. They're dr driven by the habits. They're driven by your brain trying to save energy. And so most of your decisions are unconscious and they are shaped by your environment. Um, but most of us think that every decision that we're making is individual and conscious. So we overestimate how much conscious decision making we are, we are doing, but also the individual responsibility ideology is just very convenient for a government that doesn't want to help people. <laughs> so it, it's fine, I'll, I'll let you think that it's you. And then I can be over here making oil millions. Yeah. <laughs> With my shares and cheesy watches. <laughs> exactly. No, that's, that's, a, that's a, a funny and true way of putting it. At the individual level though, and I'm a big advocate of this despite my politics, which sometimes talk of the individual unless you're just going after one Tory whose fault <laughs> everything bad in the world is. <laughs> Um, the individual can only be held responsible in very specific ways. So I struggled internally sometimes by recognising the truth in my experience of things that I'd seen in recovery from addiction. When I see people coming into the recovery community and they're battered and they're bruised from a life of trauma and a life of turning to alcohol and drugs because they used to like how it made them feel and then they got stuck on it. The first thing that they have to do to begin the journey of recovery is admit that they as an individual are fucked. This is the first step and right along the various steps in the recovery journey it's really about piecing together the truth of how they got into that mess and cleaning up the wreckage. But it's all the emphasis on yes you can tap into the power of a community around you but it must come from you. You must be the driving force and you must choose to channel what little will you do have in the right direction so that when the brain does take over, it takes over in a context where there are better decisions to be made in that area. Now, when somebody comes to you, perhaps they are uh, morbidly obese, perhaps they have uh, some kind of mobility issue that's to do with being inactive. There is a real sensitivity that you have to deploy when, when you're dealing with people. So your work goes far beyond just having knowledge of nutrition 
and weightlifting and fitness, it's also kind of the role that a counsellor might play or even a doctor might play in terms of having a certain sort of bedside manner when you're approaching conversations where people feel very, very vulnerable and maybe even quite a lot of shame about where they are at in life. How do you navigate that and what are some of the challenges of that? I think it's just being human, to be honest. Like, a lot of people actually can end up crying on their first ever call with me, and I hope it's not in about me, but you know. <laughs> uh, I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's good that people, because uh, often what happens is you start the conversation and you're like, tell me what's going on, and they just blurt it all out and end up, and they're obviously just looking for this sort of release, and they're basically saying, help me. Um, and I think what helps me is. I've been that person, like I've went through that. A lot of people use food because as an emotional thing, it's a comfort blanket basically and a bit like what you were saying there about recovery, they got enjoyment from it but then they ended up in a cycle that wasn't working for them. That's exactly what happens with food for a lot of people, that's where I ended up with it. Um, and you've just got to sort of say to them, look it's fine, there's no shame. I think as long as I approach it without any judgement and basically just let them be honest and then just basically give them like a, a sort of free space to, to discuss it and I would never ever berate someone for doing something wrong it's just like okay you done it so what like a lot of people will message me going I went out last night and I wait way too much and blah 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 and I'm just like did you enjoy it yeah good right cool let's try again today yeah and it's it, it's it's about seeing that in the context of a longer journey where just as long as you're minimizing the frequency of, of things like mm -hmm. that happening as you say if you're consistent most of the time that's that's what you're you're going to become and and I'm, I'm assuming although i may be wrong um that also you might deal occasionally with people who have issues who have developed issues around food around mental health uh, and just a quick kind of content warning, I'm just making brief reference to eating disorders because I know that that is a, a, I know that that is a massive issue that's out there, partly due to the, the, the this perfect image that we're all trying to we're all trying to meet, and then how we try to control how we look through how we eat, what we eat, how we react when we do. So I've heard stories of people who don't can't talk about calories, for example. They can't step on the scales. These things are triggers. But my right saying you'll always be able to adapt a strategy for any person who's struggling with anything like that. There is a way forward for anyone out there. Yeah, definitely. Like it's not a one size fits all. So when some people have came to me in the past and they were like, I can't go on the scales, like I've got trauma from past things that have happened and I place too much emphasis on it and we go, right, we don't need the scales. We'll, we'll measure progress in other ways. Um, and even over time, what you can find is they'll actually start, the further they get into the process and the more that they see that actually you don't need to feel shame or guilt about going and having a pizza or whatever, they start kind of going, all right, maybe I'll step on the scales and it's not that bad. It all sort of like builds on to one another really, like, you know, and starts having positive Influences. And it, it, it must be, I mean, this would be partly why you do it, I suppose. You know, that in and of itself is quite a rewarding thing to, yeah. to bear witness to, eh? Definitely. Like, that's why I've done it. I, um, I had to go through my own transformation, and it was um, my coach, who's actually now my boyfriend, he got me through it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and I sort of thought, that's absolutely changed my life. And being in a situation where I'd, well, I'm never getting out of this. Like, it was just too difficult. There was too much misinformation. Like, I just didn't know what I was doing. And I honestly thought, that's me now. Like, I'm just this person. I just thought, you know what? I want to help other people see it's not actually as complicated as that it needs to be. And just with a little bit of, like, a nudge in the right direction and then constantly, like, being their wee cheerleader, they'll get there eventually, do you know? Yeah. Uh, um, oh, um, oh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to open up for questions maybe in about 10 minutes. I've got a feeling there will be a lot of questions actually. This is a really good discussion, isn't it, folks? Yeah, yeah, it is. It really is. Now, I'm looking for the kind of, there are obvious overlaps between the two of you. 
in terms of uh, the, the, the areas that your work involves, you know, understanding, knowing about, having sensitivity to. But also there is this, you, you, you're driven by a desire to inform people, to help arm people with the correct information so that they can make uh, better choices. Now, if there's any people in the audience uh, tonight who might have questions and not be able to uh, get, get, um, uh, get to ask them, there's a couple that I would just back, back to you now, kind of on the average person's behalf, who's maybe thinking, for example, it's too late to start. It's too late to start. I'm at a certain age now. I've been living the way that I've been living. I've got a dodgy knee. I make weird noises when I bend down <laughs> to pick up socks. My couch is so fucking comfy. <laughs> How do you get somebody who is kind of already accepted, mm. perhaps wrongly, that there are no paths forward to better mobility, better cardiovascular health and better mental health. What's the sort of message, and I'll just kind of throw this to, to, to both of you, a ball on deck thing that you would say to someone maybe who is a little bit older? I know. <laughs> um, so if I were talking just about brain health, which I tend to talk about quite a lot, um, I would talk about the fact that there's some, like beautiful research out there that shows that people with early risk factors, they're older, they've already got early signs of cognitive decline. When they make these lifestyle changes, they can halt and sometimes reverse that decline. So it's never too late. You can always do something. And I think that's really encouraging. And I think more broadly, it's, it's about let it, extending the horizon because I think we're so used to having a four week, eight week, 12 week plan that we think we have to make all of those changes within that time period. Whereas if you extend that timeline and you're saying, actually, this is the rest of my life, then the first day doesn't have to be perfect because you've got the rest of your life to fix it. Um, and you can give yourself the grace of thinking, well, if it took me 10, 15, 30 years to get here, then I need to give myself a bit of self-compassion and a bit of grace to be like, it might take me a little while to get out of it, but I can do it if you've got the right support yeah. as well. And to, to use that, a longer timeline to say, well, let me just see what I can do. Yeah, and, and, and you kind of made reference there to that sort of old adage of use it or lose it, mm -hmm. where, you know, whatever it is, whether it's muscle strength, whether it's kind of cognitive bandwidth, um, the more that we rely on a kind of physical or mental resource, the more that our mind and body will deliver the resources so that we can keep engaging in that action. But I guess part of the aging process is that the body's trying to conserve so much as we get older. So the minute that we stop doing something, it's like, okay, that system is now offline. <laughs> and so it, 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 can, it, it can be a difficult thing to, to, to make a move on. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea that you can, in some cases, even reverse a decline yeah, yeah. in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Nikki. Uh, when when uh, we started working together, it was well over a year ago yep. now. So most of the time, uh, we'll, we'll get a ball on deck terminology for those of you who might not know what we're talking about. Uh, I, I went into what's called a bulk, right? So most of the time I've worked with Nikki, I've been bulking, which is, well, I'll let Nikki explain what, what bulking is and then if you can explain what the reverse of, of that is, just for the people out there who are not up on the lingo. Yeah, <laughs> so bulking is basically a process where you're trying to put muscle on. You're going to put a little bit of fat on, but we're trying to do it in a way where you're building as much muscle as possible and as little fat as possible. Um, so you would be eating in a surplus, basically. Um, so you'd be eating more calories than your body actually requires and then training to try and create muscle as well. Um, the reverse of that is cutting which would be trying to drop body fat, which is where we've now got to with yourself. Um, but you, again, you want to do that in a way where you hold on and retain as much muscle as possible um, whilst dropping the body fat so that you end up looking nice and hinged. Yeah, date, date, date <laughs> night clean, date <laughs> night fresh. Now, the, the thing is, um, even though I had got a bit of experience in the gym in terms of like the movements, exercises yeah. and that sort of stuff, I'm pretty confident going into the gym training away where I avoid injuries and all of that sort of stuff. But I still need someone in my corner and someone to be kind of accountable to. But the thing that surprised me, and I wonder if it would surprise you in your own life, depending on where you're at, I had kind of postponed the idea of a cut because the idea of eating less food 
seemed like it would be a real trigger for stress. Mm -hmm. I had this idea I was going to be hungry all the time. I had this idea I was going to have no energy. And I had this idea that I was going to rebound in some kind of serious way where I'd get trapped in that shame cycle of eating and feeling bad, eating and feeling bad. And what really surprised me, maybe you can kind of elaborate this, and feel free to talk about me personally as well, I'm, I'm all good, um, is that that was something I built up in my head and the opposite was true, wasn't it? Yeah, because it, it can be really refreshing when you actually go into a cut because you, you feel good. You're not, like if people have a tendency or when you were bulking, you're eating more than you require and you're probably eating things that are more processed. So you, you feel a bit sluggish, feel a bit bloated. That's when you're going to actually lack in energy because you just constantly feel a bit full. Whereas when you go into a cut, is if you're eating the right kind of foods, then you'll, you'll never feel hungry. Um, but you'll actually feel really good and really fresh. And if you're eating the proper nutrients and stuff like that as well, you'll be really energized. Plus, it helps you feel in control. You feel that you're taking control of something. That, that was exactly it. That was exactly it for me. And, I, and I've, been main, I've, been, I've been on that journey of continuing to drop body weight while filming television programme, doing a UK tour and preparing for the fringe. And that was why I thought, I was like, I can't keep postponing it. Yeah. But my life never is quiet. <laughs> I kept going, there'll be this moment where I'll have the, all the free time and I can just do all the stuff that I need to do and just focus on that. And then I was just like, do you know what? That's that put it off to Monday attitude, creeping in in a different way. And actually the one bit of control that I felt in the midst of this crazy kind of six month schedule is making decent decisions. Every night having eaten a restaurant with colleagues, but at the same time knowing, well, if I have a wee protein shake before I go to the restaurant, I won't feel as hungry, so I won't feel as tempted to get the big giant bowl of chips or whatever. And just making those, making those little decisions. And the final thing before I, kinda, um, be before I throw it open. Um, mental health is, 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 I would say, now at a place where people are more comfortable with discussing it openly. And I think this is partly because social media provides a platform where people get an example of how other people talk about it and they start to realise that they can talk about it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna have a provocation here, right? And then you guys can kind of tell me in your own way, from your own experience and expertise, how close to the truth my assertion is, or correct me, right? There is no better mental health if all we do is eat shite. What's your take on that? <laughs> Um, I think I'm a bit predictable on that. Um, well, uh, your brain is made of and depends on certain nutrients that you can only get from your diet. And so if you're not getting those, if you're low on those, then both the structure in terms of your membranes, your actual brain cells, and the function, the, the making your neurotransmitters, your serotonin, your dopamine, is stuck, it breaks down. The clearance of toxic proteins breaks down. Your quality of your sleep, which is essential for mental health, breaks down. And so I, I think it's a kind of nonsense to try and imagine that you can fix this physical or, or shape or assist or help this physical organ without attending to its nutrition. It, it doesn't make sense to me. It needs a certain kind of fuel to operate op optimally. Yeah. And, and sort of what, what you must see real improvements in the mental health of your clients when they embark on that journey, even just through little changes. This is the thing, isn't it? The smaller changes. Definitely. And you see it from like week one or week two. And it's because of that control. They're finally taking control and they're finally realizing, oh, I don't, I don't need to eat the crisps. The crisps aren't calling me. Actually, I can say no to them, do you know? And it's as soon as you make one decision where you go, I don't want to eat that, I'm going to have this instead. It gets easier to do it the second time, it gets easier to do it the third time. And then you start going, oh, I'm actually capable of more than I thought. And it just, it creates a sort of positive feedback loop. And then you go, all right, I might actually be capable of going to the gym too. Do you know? And it just, you feel better, you feel more energetic and that sort of just leads on to wanting to do things that are going to improve your health as well. Yeah, and, and the final thing I guess is just to say that it, 
within reason, anybody can make changes. People who are living with disabilities, people who have other mobility issues, mental health problems. We, we could be kind of talking about it here from a sort of a certain perspective that might seem like it's not factoring in other difficult circumstances that people might have. But there really is potential for anybody who, who, who wants to make a change to do it. Am I right in saying that? Definitely. And one of the best things you can do for your health, your mental health, and also if you did want to lose the fat or something like that, is walking. It, it, like, it's the best thing you can do, and it's accessible to just about everybody. I've even got a client who's sort of got long-term ill health, and the thing we focus on with her is, is walking, um, just small little increments each day. And building it up. And it's just so unsexy, isn't it? When someone <laughs> tells you that, you're like, I'm paying you money <laughs> to tell me to go for a walk. <laughs> the fuck is this all about? <laughs> and that's the curse, isn't it? So we gravitate to the people on the steroids because they look extreme and they're doing all these stupid exercises that make no sense. But actually, it's just pure, banal, little changes and a quite a boring, predictable lifestyle with the occasional fuck it button hit. Yeah, yeah. of course. Now I'm going to open that up for a for, uh, quarter of an hour. An hour. Um, so the lights are coming up there. Don't be startled. <laughs> and um, uh, if you would like to, to ask a question or, or make a comment. And also, I, I, would, I would encourage people if they feel that they want to share some of their personal experience. Um, I'll, um, I, 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 this is being recorded, but if anyone wants to share their personal experience and they want to indicate after, then I, I'll be quite happy just to kind of cut the, the, the Q&A of this out. I don't want anybody to feel too self-conscious, but I feel like we're capturing a wee moment here where people might be open. We've got someone here in the front row. Thanks. Um, just a couple of kind of points, questions, I guess. You know, um, you know, we're talking about the kind of bigger issues, and, and we're all a product of our environment so much. And in a way, it's like, you know, um, modern life and lifestyles are so sedan sedentary now. You know, and we all, you know, so many of us sit at computers all day, or we're, we're in our cars, or whatever. And so, in a way, it's like making it down to the individual again to you know, join that gym or make that effort. And I just think, you know, I, I just wonder whether there's a way, you know, I guess it comes back to the government doing something or just like that almost like companies have an obligation to have some kind of scheme that, you know, has workers access to exercise or, or something. It's just like really hard to, you know, make that change as an individual. And there's probably a tiny percentage of people who are actually going to the gym or doing that and, and I guess my other point is that you know um, you know I'm 55 now and I've seen my weight kind of go on in the last few years and and it's like I kind of realized um, I've got to that point where the only time I have a really good dance is when I got to a wedding which I never ever <laughs> thought I would actually get to that point but it's true and I just think I'm not a fan that much of the gym but I love dancing and I love doing like expressive stuff and I always like read with jealousy that, you know, I used to live in London for a long time or New York or London have these like daytime dance alcohol free classes. And I just feel if there was something a little bit more exciting or creative like that, you know, just to kind of mix just it up. Just because the kind of walk, walking can be boring for people. <laughs> it can though. But that's, you can, that's why people who are into sports, yeah. you know, football or rugby or tennis or something, they're, 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 burning, they're, they're burning calories without even necessarily thinking about it. I mean, do you think that there's a place, uh, I'll throw this to either of you, um, do you think there's a place for employers uh, to be more active and encouraging the people that work for them? Or do you think that that's, that, that, that's an unrealistic expectation? I think you saw it a lot during lockdown more, um, and it showed what they could do. Like, I know that, because I have a corporate job as well, and they would put on lunchtime Zoom fitness classes or they would do walk-in meetings so there wasn't an expectation to be sitting at your laptop. You could all just go out with your phone and actually get a walk-in that way. So, And I think just obviously since we've went back to more normal, that's just all fell away. So it's shown that they could do it so they could maybe just continue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Probably you, have you got anything to say on that? Um, 
I think, because I think we can look to other, also, like, find some salsa classes in the other class. <laughs> I'm going on top of this. Um, but I think we can look to kind of other cities. Like, we know that lots of cities on the continent are really good for making places safe and comfortable to walk and cycle. So you have these active commutes and they build in movement as just part of an incidental part of your day. Um, so I, again, I think that's about government investment on one level. The only, my only hesitation about um, uh, corporate wellness, and this is as someone who is invited in to do lots of corporate wellness talks, <laughs> is, it, is that sometimes I feel like I'm being brought in as the solution to the corporate problem. So that the person is like, they're burnt out, and they're t our, our staff, they're exhausted, they're burnt out, they're tired. And I'm supposed to tell them to eat vegetables and go for a walk, and actually what they need is a more reasonable work life balance and, and a, a nice boss. Um, so <laughs> that's my only caution about that kind of the, um, the incentive for the workplace to look after their, their staff. Yes, I think they should do it, but they should also really look into what parts of the workplace are adding to the stress and the difficulty that their staff are experiencing. Yeah, and I mean, as, as someone who works in media, particularly on television, you would not believe the working conditions. <laughs> now, fair enough, you might say, oh, well, you get paid well and you get to be on the telly and I uh, go, well, yes, of course, but I mean, I'm, I sit here right now and I, I question every day. I don't know if that's a fair trade-off. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're on our feet all day. We're doing a lot of steps, but just in certain industries, there is almost no leeway for anything that you need other than what you've agreed to before you sign the contract. And I would imagine that that would be even worse than an Amazon fulfillment centre, an ironically named fulfillment centre, uh, <laughs> where you're easily replaced. Um, so it's, it's a tough one, you know, where there's that overlap between the employer and the individual employee, because you can never really trust your boss, can you? Um, obviously, if my boss is listening or whoever, <laughs> my boss, we're talking about I'm the fucking boss. Um, any more questions, comments? Okay, we've got, right, we'll go for you, sir, there, and then we'll get around as many of you as we can. Yeah, I, I used to run a lot in, in my younger days, and then I, <coughs> that got behind me, but in my late 50s, I took up cycling for a charity uh, bike ride. Now in my late 60s, for me, it's been a real find, you know, and it's, you get a great sense of achievement out of it. You can cycle on your own, you can cycle with friends, so you get that conversation a sense of achievement if you cycle up a 16 plus percent hill and then go like crazy down the hill. So for me, <laughs> it's been a real find. And I think, you know, cycling to work is good. It's good for fitness, but I'm not as sure as it is as good for actually expanding the feel good factor. It's, it's a means of keeping fit. But once you take it up as a hobby and you design routes that take you out to nice places, you get a different sense of, of what it's like. Going back to the corporate thing, some of the companies uh, are now in cycle to work type uh, opportunities where they will give big sums of money or at least a third or the company I used to work for will give up to half of the price of a new bike up to a certain value. Mm -hmm. So to encourage people to take up, up cycling and it was a pretty effective way of, uh, of doing it. Uh, thank you for your comment and, and, um, and for sharing a bit of your experience. Uh, there's also just the, the, the impracticality of cycling for a lot of people, depending on where they live and, and, and the roads. And obviously it's a, it's a bit of a lightning rod politically just now, trying to make those adjustments in society. And also cyclists themselves can be very passionate. I got in about a bother last week with <laughs> some cyclists because I took a picture of not being able to cross the road at the World Cycling Championships. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I think that they, they thought I was saying that, that I hated them or something. And it was like... I mean, I was like, oh my God, this is intense. <laughs> so yeah, uh, lots of stuff for the cyclists to work on there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, uh, I'm just trying to make sure we got a nice, a nice balance. Yourself there on the one to third row. Yeah, first of all, I'm sorry because I come from the country that kind of demonized fat and really, <laughs> really <laughs> brought sugar to the forefront. And as a result, I think most of us really suffer from that addiction to sugar. And You're I'm American. Yeah. Oh, but we're, 
we're from the UK, we, we brought America to the forefront. <laughs> it really comes back it's to us, fault. doesn't it? Like all the shit things in the world. But what do you do about priming? Because I feel like a lot of times you can be on the right track and then you're like just on the road to the grocery store, you're bombarded by by advertisements and media and then even just getting into the grocery store there's not there's not even food in the grocery store it's like what two two aisles and that's it so what do you do for your brain um for sugar addictions and for those kind of yeah oh, i guess that's a giant question <laughs> <laughs> um but prime so priming is that the idea that actually which is what advertising does which is to the more that you are presented with an image, even a brand name, you know, sometimes brands will just let you know they exist, the more favorable you feel towards them. And certainly, and there are genetic differences between, the type, uh, between people who are sen more sensitive to food cues than others. Some people are really sensitive to information that tells them that food is available. And these brain changes will drive them, they'll make them more likely to eat and more likely to eat more. And so the food environment becomes a much more hostile place for those people. And you won't know if you have those genes. You won't know if that's the way your brain is made. You will just think you're a greedy person or you eat too much. Um, in, in terms of things like priming, this is one of the places where education does help, like letting people know that that is the function of, of advertising. And when you know, it's almost like, what's that, that, that zombie? What's it called? That movie, that zombie movie where they take off the glasses and suddenly they see uh, they live. It's like that. Like you're like, wow. <laughs> like there are adverts for food everywhere. Like McDonald's needs to remind me it exists. Like really? <laughs> so letting people know. And in the, the Brazilian um, National Food um, Advisory. So you know we have the NHS has the Eat Well guideline. The Brazilian equivalent says it includes let children know the function of advertising. Let them know, teach them that advertisements are not in their favor, they're there to in, um, increase consumption. So starting education early, giving people a little bit of psychological education can just balance, balance the, the battle because we know that marketers have been using psychology against us for decades. <laughs> like they've been doing it for years. So it's kind of like just arming the public with the same kind of information. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the in industry that convinced us that, that, that women lighting up cigarettes for the first time was an act of, of liberation. In a sense, it was, but it's mad that, you know, that that was celebrated the world over as, we're free, we can smoke too, lads, ha ha, get up, you. And the male tobacco owners are just like, ho 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 ho. So it really is a real, a real minefield. We've got time for one more question uh, or comment. Yourself there at the back. Hello. I've spent my whole life um, on a diet, my adult life anyway, and I've learned to eat healthy. However, emotional eating, I eat when I'm happy because my family always ate celebrated food. I eat when I'm sad because I find food a comfort. So. And I haven't learned how to undo that mm -hmm. yet, even though I eat quite healthily otherwise. Mm -hmm. Is it a problem for you? Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. that's the other thing. Like, I, I, I did a podcast with a, a colleague of mine, Rini McGregor, where we talk about comfort eating and whether it's legit. And I think there is a way, there is a sense in which it absolutely is. Like, if you're walking home and it's raining, you've had a terrible day, your train was late, your feet are wet, then, and you get home, you're like, now do I have a salad? <laughs> or do I have a lovely bowl of soup and a cheese toasty? then you know there's there's the nourishment but there's also the kind of other physiological component the physical components the warmth and the coziness maybe an association that you have and i think there's a legitimacy to that the issue is when it becomes the only source of comfort that you have when it becomes the only tool in your toolbox to deal with happiness with sadness with frustration with grief whatever so that's why i ask whether it actually is a problem for you because a little bit i think is absolutely fine and legit um it just depends on what other resources you have um I think, and I have to raise my hand and say that I'm biased about this because this is kind of where I sit, I think it's very, very difficult 
to try to address emotional relationships with food by yourself. Because for me, f food and eating are so fundamental. You know, and our, our relationship with food starts very, very early. And our first relationships are predicated around the eating experience at the breast or at the bottle as children. That there can be things in there that are very deeply embedded that it's very hard for you to see from the inside. You need an external perspective. Yeah. So if it's accessible to you, that would be working with someone around that. So just identify what those associations are, what your, what your skills and opportunities are. Can you skill yourself up? Can you find other ways to express those emotions, to ask for comfort, to seek comfort, all those sorts of things, just so that you have a few more tools in your toolbox. Yeah, I, I would like to kind of throw that at you for, the, for, for a quick final word, Nikki. If, if, uh, what's your name? Sandra. If Sandra came to you, um, you know, over the phone, over a Zoom call or whatever, and basically just said there what, what she was saying, how would you practically, uh, how would you practically address that? Well, it's actually very similar to what you said, but it's it, it's actually more habit than anything else. Like you habitually go to those things, but it's like we can celebrate in other ways that don't involve food and drink. It's often like when people um, meet up with a friend, they always think it's got to be, do you want to go for dinner? Do you want to go for lunch? Do you want to grab a coffee? There's so many other things to do that aren't around food and drink. And it's about maybe to celebrate you go, going to have a really nice bath tonight and read a book. Do you know what I mean? To like chill out or, or that would maybe be more your comfort thing actually. To celebrate it might be like, you know, I'm going to go and phone a friend and tell her the good news. It, mm. It's find something else to channel that emotion somewhere else and stop looking at food as a reward or something like that. Food is fuel for your body and I think we need to start viewing it as that more rather than it always being a sort of hedonistic thing that we can enjoy sometimes you just need to go this isn't exactly what i want right now but i know this is what my body yeah. needs and i know this is what's going to be good for me yeah this is a breast of chicken <laughs> and it's not very nice when you think about it <laughs> on so many levels uh, may i recommend trampolining also as a diversionary <laughs> activity i took my wife to a trampoline park for her birthday last year and we had an amazing time uh, that concludes uh, the event for this evening. If you've enjoyed the topics here, if you've enjoyed the format, if you've enjoyed the spirit of the event, uh, then I may I recommend that you buy further tickets for the rest of the events <laughs> that we have running until uh, Saturday. And if you, you, you don't want to do that, you're not in a position to do that, that's fine. I'll thank you for, for buying your tickets uh, tonight. Uh, I just want to thank my guests, Kimberly and Nikki, very, very much. Um, for uh, Kimberly's travelled, travelled to, uh, travelled quite a distance to be with us here this evening, and I know it was it was Nikki's first uh, public event, so I, I was excited to to let all you guys get th the sense of her that I get every week with my Sunday check-in video. Um, thank you all for coming, and thank you for those of you who did open up with some of your own experiences and I, I, I think it says a lot about the environment we're trying to create here with common people that some of you who probably we don't even know each other felt comfortable enough uh, to come forward and share about your experience thanks very much enjoy the rest of the fringe take care <laughs>